of Palestinian refugees is not only tangibly practical discussion of what might befall millions of Palestinians and millions of Israelis uh, should return ever take place. It is a field which conjures up more general preoccupations with identity, morality, personhood and statehood, and the very meaning of the social. Now this paper comes in three main parts. The first part is a culturally nuanced depiction of sensibilities towards return on both sides, on both the Israeli and the Palestinian side. And it, and it also looks critically at some legal and moral philosophical work uh, done on this issue in recent years. In the second part, I employ Christopher's notion of objection to underwrite a more newest and nuanced and hopefully more practical plan of action for Palestinian re refugees. And the last and probably shortest section looks at the role of intellectuals and academics in debates of sus such um, existential issues. So let me begin then. The Palestinian claim to a right of return and the Israeli counterclaim, which negates it, emanate from diametrically opposed meta-narratives of 20th century history. Palestinians see themselves as an ancient peaceful nation whose territory was transgressed in, in the early 20th century by Western colonialism spearheaded by an opportunistic Jewish contingent. The result was dispossession and dispersal in 1948 of at least 750,000 persons who along with their descendants now make the largest refugee com community and the longest crisis of displacement of our time. One Palestinian estimate claims that refugees now number 6.5 million. There are other more modest estimates, but there is general agreement that some 1.3 million Palestinians, those living in refugee camps and, and separate urban neighborhoods in Lebanon, Syria, and in the occupied territories, experience most acute economic and social hardship. Like three million additional Palestinians living in slightly better material conditions, uh, they too have no citizenship status and very few options of free movement, employment, and travel. The Palestinian narrative, buttressed by a conviction that most ordinary Palestinians had little or no control over the war that led to their demise, informs an intuitive, self-evident moral stance featuring four themes. One, return is the only genuine rectification of the gross injustices of 1948 and of suffering incurred in exile since. Those personally displaced in 1948 and their descendants make one homogenous, indivisible community of entitlement. Three, refugees should be offered a spectrum of possible options, including return to their original communities and property, restitution, compensation, genuine integration in their current environments abroad and, and resettlement elsewhere, so an array of options. Four, choice between these various options is, this, is the prerogative of Palestinians, both as a collective and as individuals. Now, few Palestinians actually believe that full return could ever happen. This notwithstanding, the moral resolve and political efficacy of this position remains compelling. The Palestinian call for comprehensive return is a unifying, unifying voice in a society otherwise characterized as fragmented. Refugees and non-refugees, pe peasants and urbanites, rich and poor, Christians and Muslims, those in favor of a two-state solution and those espousing a unitary state, secularist, secularists and is Islamists see the call for return as a self-explanatory duty. It has become a valence, an ideological tenet at the heart of the canonic Palestinian view of what the nation is. Palestinian uh, identity now hinges on belief in return. They are, as it were, a returning people. The idea of Palestinian return is, of course, highly emotive for Israelis too. Zionism is premised on a notion of Jewish diaspora in return, which is as powerful and even better institutionalized. 
Not surprisingly, Palestinian claims to be, the, to be the returning people are viewed by the majority of Israelis through a thick veil of denial and unarticulated guilt. Most Israelis accept that when a Palestinian state eventually emerges alongside Israel, refugees will be returning there. The option that some might be allowed to return to their original locations within Israel, however, is unthinkable for an unshakable majority of Israelis. It disorients Israelis not only because of the potential demographic, geographic, and political consequences, but also due to the stressful load which it exerts on key symbols and scenarios of Israeli culture and identity. The concept of Palestinian return flies in the face of mainstream Israelis' views of contemporary history as Israeli time, a long overdue epoch of ethno-national and demographic success which finally rectifies a crooked cosmology, cosmologic order that had tormented Jews for so many centuries. A Palestinian return from this standpoint is tantamount to a subversion of the normal march of time. Both communities, in other words, experience the refugee issue as critical for their collective futures. The result is a zero-sum game perceived as existential. People on both sides genuinely believe that should the balance of culpability and duty tip against them, their national project and possibly their physical survival could be in jeopardy. Concomitantly, clear majorities on other side view any tendency toward concession in this matter as collective suicide, or worse, treason. No wonder public debate within both communities about the future of the ref refugees is still underdeveloped mostly restricted to ideologically laden cliches. So the, the debate itself, one might say, is only beginning, or in some cases haven't, hasn't even started. The future of Palestinian refugees, however, raises more general socio-political issues. For most people, most of the time, public matters boil down to what Ulrich Beck has dubbed new politics, affairs relevant to the immediate and intermediate future, which take place in specific social horizons, consumerism, aesthetics and efficiency of cities, compositions of paychecks, tax forms, <coughs> insurance portfolios, and for those involved, welfare. Matters which transcend these frames of reference and deal with collective existential issues are only seldom present in most people's routine perceptions of the political. The putative return of Palestinians is of the latter type, it conjures up profound historiosophic sensibilities and heartfelt views about the very constitution of the social. For Palestinians, these sensibilities follow an implicit Augustinian lo logic. Saint Augustine, as you recall, saw this world as a sequel to a primordial state of nature, whereby before original sin, people's innocence and restraint made laws and other types of coercion quite superfluous. It was only following the sin that God had to intervene and to ordain a social order, what we now know as the state, with its teleological role as a means to speed up eventual salvation, in St. Augustine's view. This mutatis mutandi is the nostalgic res res resonance which the status quo ante, 1948, carries for most Palestinians. Life was peaceful and perfect. Solidarity was based on kinship, nurturing, and community spirit. Then came the sinful war of 1948, a break with earlier bliss, which produced chaos and suffering. This sanctified depiction of olden days brings the past into the present in ways that are conducive to the construction of a morally inevitable future. The Palestinian state and protostate are framed in truly Augustinian fashion as entities whose chief remit is to facilitate return. So this importation of the past into the present entails and determines a moral future. This vision, however, is in tension with contemporary reality on the ground. Palestinians dream of the terrain they left behind, the rolling hills, the oaks and olive trees, the spring, the village, the lemons and the figs. But this terrain is hardly there any longer, not least since Israel 
a nationalizing state with an average growth rate since 1948 of some 5% per annum, has radically transformed the terrain. Only a small proportion of the 450 Palestinian villages and towns destroyed in 1948 are still discernible even as ruins. Most of them are covered over by Israeli forestry, agricultural projects, and rural, suburban, and urban settlements. When Palestinians talk about return, however, they do not only invoke a national geographic. Evidently, they wish to go back also to a social order in which Israel and Israeli sovereignty are non-existent. One reason I believe why Palestinian negotiators have been reluctant to present their Israeli counterparts with operational plans for an actual return is that such plans, once discussed, would compel them to make a very difficult choice between, on the one hand, a vision in which Israel as a political entity no longer exists, something they know their Israeli counterparts cannot even begin to imagine, let alone endorse, and on the other, acceptance of Israel as a legitimate and durable entity. The latter is difficult because of the obvious implication it has for Palestinians and for, and for would-be re returnees. Rather than coming back to the idealized Augustinian past, the best they can hope for is a return to a place which has long become, in De Sartre's terms, Israeli space, and in Anderson's idiom, part of Israeli time. This point is, is a key to what comes later. Unless the state of Israel ceases to exist as we know it, Israeli consent, any Israeli consent, for the return of any Palestinian refugees to Israel can only be premised on an arrangement by which returning Palestinians form a new subset of the existing community of Palestinian citizens of Israel. Elsewhere I label the Palestinian citizens of Israel, who now represent some 16.5% of Israel's 6.5 million population, as a trapped minority, enjoying certain economic advantages through incorporation into the Israeli economy, the Palestinian citizens of Israel nevertheless remain one of the most dependent, poor, and least mobile communities in the land. Formerly holding Israeli citizenship, they enjoy the right to vote and to be voted into any office. Their minority statu status, however, and their resentment harbored by most Jewish Israelis greatly limit their access to power and resources. The predicament whereby the state that grants them citizenship is at war with their mother nation is confusing to, en to, to many amongst them, clouding their sense of identity, belonging, and affiliation. Coming back for a moment to the Jewish-Israeli majority, whereas the Palestinian outlook on return is Augustinian, Israelis reflect an implicit Hobbesian view of society and politics. The state of nature is depicted not as a pre-existing temporality, but as a disconcerting alternative to order as we know it. In Hobbes's case, of course, the monarchy he dearly wanted to restore in lieu of Cromwell's Republic. In the absence of order, when all is up for grabs, even de decent humans will resort to violence, lest others beat them to resources and subsistence. The quest for security does not beget security. It breeds perpetual anxiety, fear, and terror. And yes, I know this sounds familiar to many of you. This alternative state to the current is, by and large, what Israelis come up when con contemplating Palestinian return. Not surprisingly, this sensibility has bred an indefinite state of emergency, best theorized by Agam Ben, and in the case of Israel, characterized by Jacqueline Rose as the gradual militarization of Zionism. The lull in any meaningful political process between Israel and the Palestinians since the summer of 2000 opened a window of opportunity for academics to think the refugee issues afresh and play with new ideas. And let me very briefly acquaint you with at least two trajectories in these studies. Lawyers writing in support of the Palestinian assertion of a right to return, and I have a list of them here, as well as those clearly against such assertion from the Israeli side, 
tend to structure their inqu inquiry as exercises in law finding, invoking instances from international practices, UN declarations and resolutions, international treaties, norms and rulings, they seek the ultimate trump card, a decisive piece of legal language that would object objectively define the international law perspective on the matter. It is a problematic quest. The fluid definition of the field of international law, what actually constitutes it, what it actually consists of, and the hierarchy between its various components means that agreement Agreement on logical rules of deduction and applicability is hard to come by. The field is further complicated by the rather non-reflexive nature of much legal discourse, where writers do not readily disclose the political logic and moral assumptions that guide them. The result is often legal experts on either side talking past each other. So not much joy from recent legal attempts to resolve the refugees issue. Moral philosophical debate has been somewhat different. The compelling intuitive morality that guides the Palestinian position on redress poses a challenge for moral philosophers who see at least some merit in the view that Zionism is legitimate and moral, at least in as much as it saved Jewish lives before, during, and after World War II, for example. Obviously, the more <coughs> legitimacy one finds in Zionism, the less self-evident the Palestinian view of the morality of return becomes. One researcher, Chaim Ganz, has recently articulated the following line of, of logic. If one accepts cultural nationalism in principle and endorses the legitimacy, legitimacy of Zionism as the expression of the national aspiration of the Jews, in other words, it is a legitimate form of cultural nationalism, the Jewish cultural nationalism, but then restricts the legitimacy of this ethno-national project to, for example, Israel's 1948 borders, the operation and conclusion is that the place for most Palestinian returnees is in the future Palestinian state outside of Israel's borders of 1948. Conversely, a different view of Israel's moral right to perform the way it did in this armed conflict or the other would, of course, yield divergent sensibilities about which territories should be made available, available for Palestinian re return. Such moral positioning of territory brings another theoretical sen sensibility into relief, Jeremy Waldron's sub supersession thesis. This, in a nutshell, is a forward-looking, essentially Lockean view, which maintains that an immoral act can, in some circumstances, be superseded by processes and events that make redressing it practically and hence morally untenable. So something bad happens, but developments later make rectifying the bad things even worse. That's, in a nutshell, the supersession theory. The passage of time, the replacement of the original refugees with the generations of their offsprings, the extent that lost property has lingering material and cultural role in the lives of those who had been dispossessed of it, the manner in which, in which the dispossessed made their grievance known, changed circumstances due to new construction and development, and of course the general balance between restituting returning refugees and displacing current inhabitants. All of these become pertinent guidelines for political decisions, according to the supersession thesis. Let me move to, to say a few words on closure. Is it realistic in the case of Palestinian refugees to look and attempt closure? Should it remain the primary goal and only benchmark? Susan Slimovic's recent study of the recent re willingness on the part of the Moroccan government to extend indemnities to political activists incarcerated, tortured, and humiliated since the 1950s suggests that victims, the state and the public, prefer spiritual rather than material progress. Acknowledgement on the part of the state of its responsibility for wrongful suffering, coupled with apology and clemency to those ones stigmatized as public enemies, takes center stage. Restitution, compensation, and indemnities come a distant second in the Moroccan case. 
When financial and, and other material arrangements do enter the negotiations, Klimowitz observes, victims tend to be less insistent on closure than might have been assumed. Rather than drive a hard, conclusive bargain, they seek more options, more maneuverability between them, and more time for consideration and procrastination. This flexibility must not be regarded as a secondary aspect of the deal. Rather, it forms an essential component of a procedure that is primarily a mental, emotional, and spiritual one. Of course, Moroccan dissidents, who on the whole retain their residency, citizenship rights, familial ties, and community webs intact, are not homologous to stateless, exiled Palestinian refugees living in squalor in Lebanon, Syria, or even Gaza or the West Bank. And yet, and no, the notion that a material settlement is symbolic of a deeper and often more important spiritual process is relevant. Yov Peled, using the notion of transitional justice, suggests that meaningful symbolic injustices are as important as more tangible redress. This encourages him to come up with a plan for Palestinian refugees which emphasizes recognition on the part of Israel of the Palestinian right to return rather than full implementation of this right. So a declaration that the right exists, an acknowledgement for Peled is more important than actually allowing people to implement it because amongst other things, the supersessions um, theory. It is a logic which in certain circumstances could sketch a workable semi-painless solution the powerful magnanimously recognize their responsibility for past injustices, publicly acknowledge their moral duty to have them rectified, and dedicate financial resources, of which they have in abundance, towards this end. The dispossessed, for their part, accept the symbolic gestures and remuneration, shelving their demand for restitution and return. Life go goes on largely uninterrupted. For Palestinian refugees, however, I'd like to argue, measures which carry emotional and spiritual import alone are not likely to suffice. Gratifying as they may be for liberal-minded intellectuals, and convenient as they are for Israeli interests, in and of themselves, their use for disenfranchised exiled Palestinians is limited. Anyway, the levels of politicization that the notion of return has been subjected to, and the manner in which return has become synonymous with Palestinian identity, dictate a pressing need for a more tangible redress. So redress would have to include both. In Powers of Horror, an essay on objection, Yulia Kristeva identifies the power to refuse as a necessary step towards empowerment and growth. She looks at the ability, or lack thereof, of a child to reject unpalatable food presented by a parent. Her suggestive example is the quintessential milk scheme, which many parents once believed was most nutritious and most children simply cannot stand. Pushed upon the child by an overbearing, in insensitive parent, the undesirable milk scheme becomes revolting. It triggers verbal protest and sometimes rebellion with bodily manifestations, tears, convulsion, spit, vomit, indigestion, excrement. The relational signif significance of these moments of corporal expressions become the backbone of Christopher's theoretical en endeavor. Obnoxious, embarrassing, off-putting, these liberating instants are, in her final an analysis, constructive. The ability to say no or do no through physical aversion is a precondition for self-assertion, individuation, separation, autonomy, and, and ultimately freedom, freedom. Of course, the argument becomes even more compelling when the rejected stuff is or could be benevolent, not necessarily stuff that does bad things to you. As some would suggest, milk skim is. When there is this duality, and there's the inclarity, maybe I'm rejecting something that is good for me. It makes the argument even more interesting. A 
caveat is in order here about epistemological limitations of applying psychoanalytic theory in socio-political analysis. But I will skip it to save time. Uh, you can expect most of it yourself, and it can come up in questions later. But I do want to go on and talk about refusal. Refusal as a formal political expression has been a part of Palestinian public culture for at least a generation. The refusal front, a loose coalition where radical left organizations joined forces with hardline Islamist factions, made its first appearance in the 1970s following the publication by the PLO of, of its 10-point plan, which included early reference to a negotiated settlement with Israel. The refusal front was then consolidated further with every new step taken by moderate Palestinians towards reconciliation. So there would be some steps for reconciliation which, which would make the refusal front even more strong and even more robust. Significantly, consolidation of Palestinian refusal invariably came in response to reconciliatory steps made by Palestinian moderates, not as reactions <coughs> to Israeli offers. I stress it here because if Christopher's theory of the abject can be used constructively here, it will have to be jump-started by an early and benevolent offer from which Israel, not other Palestinians, must make. And, sis, and since progress inevitably hinges on dialogue with enemies, let us look at this potential of a, an interesting uh, benevolent offer from Israel. Um, let us look at this potential for a moment. To make a contribution to reconciliation, an Israeli offer regarding refugees will have to meet a number of conditions. First, it must have at least some merit for at least some Palestinians. Like Christopher's, Christopher's nutritious scheme, it must have elements which Palestinians can identify as, while not perfect, at least potentially beneficial. Refusing them, in other words, must carry a price tag and trigger a dilemma, however brief one. Second, an Israeli offer in connection with the refugees should include a number of options from which the refugees can choose. Third, the structure should allow the Palestinians a substantial period, years, in which individual choices can be made. Fourth, the Palestinians should be able to leapfrog between options as they go along. Choose something now and then leapfrog to another choice later, later on in the process. The more attractive these options are, and the wider their spectrum, the easier, politically, mor morally, emotionally, it will be for refugees to do what I believe most of them have been yearning to do for decades. Say thanks, but no thanks, and liberate themselves through what I call constructive refusal. It is constructive because choice denotes autonomy and the power to, to control meaning and history, thus regaining dignity. Let, let me put it in more operational terms. A future comprehensive final settlement between Israel and Palestine, a two-state solution, is likely to include a number of elements in, in, in relation to the refugees, which by and large have been negotiated and mostly agreed between Israeli and Palestinian negotiators over the last decade. These include one symbolic recognition on the part of Israel of its primary responsibility for the emergence of the Palestinian problem in the first place, the refugee problem in the first place. Two, Israeli acceptance of the principle of the right of Palestinian refugees to return, the principle of the right of Palestinian refugees to return. Three, consent to, a, to unlimited return of refugees to the Palestinian state not to Israel, but to the Palestinians that along, alongside it. A gener four, a generous scheme <coughs> of remunerations and compensation for Palestinian property and suffering incurred in 1948 and since, with a substantial contribution from Israel. Five, generous immigration quotas for Palestinian refugees to various countries in Europe, the Americas, and in the, in the Arab world. And six, substantial contributions from the international community to Lebanon, Syria, Jordan and, of course, Palestine to underwrite plans for the integration of Palestinian refugees as equal citizens. Some Palestinians, as indicated, have already agreed, in principle, to such a spectrum of solutions. Others would perhaps go along on a collective level, but refuse to take any of it as individuals, 
in a defiant act of empowerment and pride. Some refugees, uh, uh, though not very many, I remind you, have a better life now than what might await them with return. So this is an option that is conceivable. Some of them would say, we don't want it on an individual level. There are those, however, who already claim that in the absence of full return of every refugee to his or her ancestral home, including inside Israel, money substitutes are a degrading and unacceptable form of bribery, a sell-off of the national honor, and that an agreement which pushes fi finance as a substitute to actual return must be rejected outright, on principle, politically. This stand is a vocal and politically potent one, and must and one which we must not we, we, we must not ignore. Which brings us back to actual return to Israel, its feasibility and implications. In 2001, Israeli negotiators were apparently authorized to agree to the return into Israel of a limited number of Palestinian refugees. The number was rumored to be between 50 and 100,000 refugees. Of course, even if this number was pushed slightly higher, it would not transform the lives of those 1.3 million Palestinian refugees living in squalor and hardship in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and the West Bank, let alone millions of others. But let us assume that this offer or an offer along these lines, even a higher, slightly higher quota, does come out from Israel. The Palestinians will then have to prioritize and determine which individuals get the option of inclusion in the quota. Who gets the option to go, since the quota is much smaller than, than the total number? This, I argue, is best characterized as a right of first refusal and should be theorized as an opportunity for flagged objection. More on this in a moment. Whichever process and criteria the Palestinians adopt, there are a number of steps Israel could make to render this initiative more effective. One would be to decouple citizenship from residence. Decouple citizenship from residence. A, refu a refugee given an option to return to Israel who is unable or unwilling to do so will be able to claim her Israeli citizenship, passport, social security payments, and every other benefit she is entitled to without having to go to, let alone settle in Israel. Liaison with Israeli state institutions could be done at consulate-like bureaus established near communities of Palestinian refugees abroad. Decoupling citizenship from residence, while not straightforward, is by no means impossible. While most theories of citizenship stress some degree of residence as a prerequisite for citizenship, some states acknowledge non-residence as a legitimate subcategory of affiliates. Isa Chaglau's work on Turkish citizenship light, extended to German citizens of Turkish, Turkish origin, is a recent example. Israel itself extends entitlement to citizenship to Jews abroad who have never set foot in it, but who could materialize it by simply showing up. There are European states who have old age pensions, social security remittances, and entitlements to health and education extended to citizens abroad. There are voting arrangements for exp ex expatriates, and so on. Now, refugees who take decoupled citizenship without going to Israel will be able to keep this status for a substantial but ultimately finite period, perhaps a decade. So you could be, a, for a decade, you could, you could be an Israeli citizen, citizen and get all the benefits without actually going there. Failing to relocate to Israel by the end of this period will cause this type of citizenship to expire, but the vacancy will be transferred to another Palestinian individual who will in turn have a similar choice between residential and decoupled citizenship. The likely outcome whereby some of the refugees who will be offered the option to return to Israel, perhaps many of them, will refuse all contact with Israel, must not be taken as a sign of failure of this plan. Quite the contrary. It, it is precisely here that Christopher's abject theory assumes a social resonance, transcending the individualistic context of which it was initially conceived. 
A Palestinian individual offered an option to return who declines Israel is at once a private person exercising individual discretion and a political, exercising individual discretion and a political agent operating, as it were, in full view of the audience. Objection will have a redeeming impact for him or her as individual, mm -hmm. as well as symbolic significance for other Palestinians. The more esteemed and venerated the individual who thus shuns return, the more emancipating that this choice becomes for others, including others who were never offered this option. If Palestinians de determine that age is a primary criterion for, for inclusion in the quota of potential returnees, thus privileging those born in pre-1948 Palestine, a number of interesting consequences could ensue. If the Palestinians decide that age becomes the, the most important factor, it will immediately give an advantage to those who are older and, and, and in effect, to those who were born before 1948 in the old country. So what are these interesting consequences? One, singling out individuals whose lives were most directly disrupted in 1948 has important symbolic resonance. In real terms, of course, few individuals over, 40, over 58, least of all Palestinian refugees, are likely to move without their offsprings. In fact, recent surveys amongst Palestinian refugees suggest that individuals over 60 are the most resistant to the notion of living under Israeli sovereignty and most willing to substitute return for compensation and remuneration. Younger people are much more resilient in that and say, we want a return or nothing else. Older people say, we are quite willing to negotiate something else in lieu of return. The implication is that elderly refugees, if offered the option of return to Israel, are most likely to become refuseniks. Given their age and war-torn personal histories, their objection is most likely to be seen as representative of collective Palestinian pride and honor, precisely what is needed when circumstances prevent full redress and full restitution to all. There is another advantage associated with prioritizing age. It could ease Israeli anxieties about demography, which have become per so pertinent in Israeli politics recently. Jewish Israelis, who total 5 million and are surrounded by the same number of Palestinians and 50 times more Arabs in the Middle East, are convinced that any hint of approval for Palestinian return would trigger a Palestinian stampede that would change their lives forever. Since older refugees are mostly past their reproductive age, if Israelis learn that Palestinians intend to grant priority to elders, they may be willing to fix a higher quota in the first place, thus edging nearer a figure which Palestinian negotiators may be able to live with. And if most would-be returnees are indeed reluctant to return, Israeli demographic fears might be relaxed even further. Let me conclude then. The initiative I'm sketching here demystifies the problem of Palestinian refugees and their putative return by presenting operational solutions. This is not trivial. Return has been idealized and politicized by Palestinian leaderships for de decades as an elusive panacea, repeatedly portrayed as a utopian enterprise, politicized Palestinian depictions of return regularly fuse some of the more disturbing aspects of Rousseau's general will, those elements dubbed by Talmon totalitarian democracy, with a utilitarian outlook one might expect from Bentham or the young John Stuart Mill. This false collapse depicted a definitive, a definitive return as at once the pinnacle of cooperative national redemption <coughs> and the ultimate salvation of every Palestinian individual. The initiative presented here constructively subverts this mystified approach by forcing Palestinian individuals and families to make actual decisions about their lives and futures, or at least imagine making such decisions. Paradoxically, it might be said that the most dramatic success this initiative could ever have is if it were to be agreed 
developed into a workable administrative reality, but left largely void due to objection on the part of Palestinian refugees. The Palestinians' right to refuse and the powerful symbolic and political impact it entails would thus be played out most effectively. The trajectory I've developed here leaves, I must concede, one important question unanswered. Is the somewhat abstract Palestinian demand to return and the remarkable Palestinian ref refrain so far from any operational discussion of return, do they suggest that return for the Palestinian is in fact a, synon a synonym for a wish to undo Israel as a political entity? If so, what are the implications for attempts to reach a settlement? I leave this question unanswered and we can come back to it. This, article, this paper began with an attempt of a cultural nuanced description of the current impasse between Israelis and Palestinians regarding Palestinian refugees and their future. Its latter, part, its latter part moved gradually from the abstract to the concrete, from theory to practice, from principles to pragmatics, from description to prescription. In one sense, this structure mimics real life situations whereby moral and theoretical arguments made early in the process are swept aside when more concrete proposals make their first appearance. Let me end, however, with some thoughts about these in interfaces and on the role that intellectuals and academics could have in shaping them. The importance of theoretical musings and moral considerations for settling differences, including those steeped in deep historic roots, hardly needs elaboration. Political processes that overlook these sensibilities often turn into a might is right conundrum. One responsibility of intellectuals is thus to make sure morally informed theory is sensibly inserted to the political process. But saying that is not saying much. Unfortunately, intellectuals are, are often content to lay the philosophical foundations for solutions and when the crux, come, crux comes with the final stages of negotiation, let politicians take over. This is where the Aristotelian predicament reemerges with a vengeance. Politicians are not necessarily immoral or amoral, but the urgency that political decision making often assumes and the conjunctural considerations which often shape them tend to give pragmatics an edge over morality. This is not an only a lament about the insufficient role of abstract theory or moral thought in politics. It is also a statement about how pragmatism, ideally the capacity to marry the desirable with the workable, cannot and must not be assumed to represent neutrality. With its, with its explicit forward-looking emphasis on prevailing conditions as the necessary point of departure, pragmatism a priori favors those endowed. The outlook it engenders can hardly revolutionize the predicament of the disenfranchised party, or otherwise undo the suffering inflicted on them in the past and well into the present. The lure of forward-looking pragmatism, often premised on the false assertion that any change is better than no change, and hence any agreement is better than no agreement, is often facilitated by spin doctors whose role is primarily to obfuscate the naked power politics that lies behind it all. Spin doctors often take over at the precise point where intellectuals are banished or choose to vanish from the process, allowing it to effortlessly slip into simple realpolitik. To add insult to injury, distorted versions of sensibilities produced by well-meaning humanist thinkers earlier in the process sometimes reappear late as fig leaf rationalizations and justifications for political determinations that trample human dignity. I hope this paper demonstrated that coherent theory, sensible moral judgment, and due consideration of social facts can yield a positive contribution to political processes. To make a real difference in the world, however, these elements must be pursued with candor and perseverance and must be matched with intellectual and political courage. Thank you.